some other system. Anyways, Dmax works on the assumption that your model is unidimensional. So if you have a multidimensional scale, you do one factor at a time. We had a one factor model, so that worked. Uh, group level differences are integrated over the assumed normal distribution of the latent group, latent trait in the focal group. The distributions will not necessarily be the same in different dimensions, so you have to do one dimension at a time. And that's the article that we reported this in. This is what we got. This is the if this is the change in CFI in the blue for scalar invariance. So we found metric equivalents. Yay! Quite a surprise that 55 countries from Australia to New Zealand, Australia to Canada, and so on are metric equivalent. But the intercepts. There's only one, two, three countries that have differences in the intercepts that are conventionally what we would expect, a change less than 0.01 in the CFI. And those three countries are Australia to New Zealand, Canada, and the USA. English speaking, rich, with a strong child-centered pedagogy. And English, the question is, is English speaking more important or is it high social development and common pedagogical practices? I think those two are more important than we speak English. So you would say, unlike uh, Andreas Schleicher at Pisa, this booklet is not comparable. Do not compare these scores. He just goes, of course you can't pair the scores. But, and our study is not the only study that has consistently shown that on a technical level, PISA scores are not comparable. Now when we ran the DMAX, what we found is the difference in the combined uh, metric and intercept covariance matrix was relatively small for most countries. So yes, it's statistically significant, but it really doesn't matter. So, oh shoot, Andreas was right, you can compare. But, this is 0.5, an effect size of half a standard deviation. There are still countries that differ from Australia by more than half a standard deviation. Kyrgyzstan, Jordan, uh, Peru, Qatar, Moldova, uh, Mauritius, Panama, Romania, Venezuela, Trinidad Tobago, and Malta, and that's it. So, what do we think about those countries that have big effect size? They're generally not very socioeconomically well developed. In fact, the one variable that we found in PISA that we could correlate with this was the ESCS variable in PISA, which is the Economic, Social, Cultural, Capital Scale and the correlation with the difference is 0.63. So basically it says, boom, don't compare poor countries with rich countries. And if you set the threshold to 0.20, which is the one I would have preferred to set it at, as under here it's trivial, a lot more countries would have had big differences. So my sense is, based on this, PISA scores are so uncomparable, you shouldn't compare your PISA score with anybody. Except, what we did found is, if you looked at the Spanish-speaking countries, you could make an argument that it might be okay to compare Central and South America countries with each other. You could probably make a case for the German-speaking countries in Europe to compare with each other. 
you could make a strong case for the Nordic countries to compare with each other. You know, Norway, Sweden, Finland, Denmark, Iceland. Because they're socially very similar. You could make a case for the English-speaking countries, except for Trinidad and Tobago, which is an English-speaking country, comparing themselves with each other. The rich English-speaking countries could be compared. That would make a sense. So if you want to compare in Pisa, try to compare apples with apples, not apples with boots. You know, the, there's, there's no point. You could be a red apple or green apple, but don't compare it to a boot. So that was the conclusion what we made in that article here is, but of course, when you're running the juggernaut of OECD PISA, you, these are just little mosquitoes that fly around because the politicians and the governments with money pay to keep PISA going. Interestingly enough, one of my students who has worked in the PISA office in China says that after the 2000, so 2009 and 12, Shanghai was number one in the world. 2015, they added Jiangsu province, Shanghai, Beijing, and Guangzhou, and suddenly China is not number one. So since then, China has withdrawn from PISA. So, <clears throat> so it's really important to give some consideration to, is it just statistically significant because it was driven by large samples and small confidence intervals? Or was it actually a substantially large difference that you could care about? And at point 20, all of those English-speaking countries in the developed world are close enough that you don't care about. Yes? Uh, I was just reading the title. Uh, is this reading test in English in every country? No, of course not. So, uh, it's Hapisa adapted reading. Comparing OECD reading in English. Oh, okay, I see what you mean. Yes. Yeah, sorry. So, no, no. What we probably should have said is comparing Australia OECD PISA reading to other countries. It was reading in the country of the language of the country. The, so, yes, thank you. The title is misleading. It's not reading in second languages or the nth language in some countries. Yes. If this is reading in the mother tongue, the dominant tongue of that country system. There's the Russian Federation. Big difference, but it's less than, it's a small difference in probably the scalars. These differences in scalars is small. And if I, if we use the point 20, we would have said, Russia, don't compare yours, don't let them compare you. Okay, that's the take home message for me. If this difference is more than trivial, don't allow PISA to make you compare. But maybe you would want to compare the old USSR countries with each other and not bother comparing to Germany. Why would you want to do that? Right? Does it make sense? Remember, especially, assessment is political. Yeah, but, yeah, I have questions about the policy because, you, okay, you got this result and what to do next because uh, actually comparison of PISA results is very popular uh, yeah. in this world. Yeah, so they but it's wrong. Adjust. Like many popular things, it's not right. And as scientists, we are required to keep reminding people, but it's wrong. And uh, my father's an engineer. Canada engineers, when you graduate, get given a stainless steel ring that you're supposed to wear to remind you that if you build something wrong, people die because buildings and bridges fall down. It's actually based on a bridge that had fallen down and people had died in. And so the Canadian Regist Registered Engineer Society said, look, we can't allow this to happen again. We're professionals. So, when, as academic scientists, it's our job to keep reminding the politicians and the people, and in some countries the people get to choose the politicians, not in 
in every society, but to remind the people that actually that's, an, that's a false statement, that's a false comparison. So I know it's difficult when you, you get promoted by academic publications, but hopefully the professors who are at the top start saying, I'm sorry boss, but that's wrong. And if you don't listen, I'm going to write a blog and send it out and, you know, I'm going to keep telling you it's wrong until you either fire me or I lose my job or I disappear. And that's what engineers in Canada are required to do by their professional code of ethics is if they believe something is unsafe but the boss wants you to sign off, you don't sign off. And if he fires you, he fires you. That's the courage of professionalism. And so many of us don't say anything. We do this kind of study and we go, oh. and our colleagues read it and go, yeah, you're right. But the politicians don't read it, the people don't read it, and the tragedy carries on. And in the end, teachers and students suffer, and parents suffer from a false comparison. And that's really what should make us burn with the courage to say something. And unfortunately, writing in this journal is good for your career, but not good for society because politicians, they, what? International Journal of Testing? I don't want to read that. All those stats people? Look. Right? So, do not rely on previously published values and studies. Always check that it works for yours. If possible, Download the previous data set and compare. In the spirit of open science, when you finished your article, you should make the data set available for others. It's a torture to prepare this data set according to the standards. It's very difficult. Really? Yes. An ID number, no names, no identifying information about the individual. It's a giant scale. You don't put in an national ID number, you don't put in uh, you know, what address they live at, you, you anonymize the data and then you make it available. I don't think it's that hard. I, read, I just read uh, the instruction of how to prepare and what format, how to Oh, what format? As long as you upload it in a standard format that you use, other people can download it and import it. If they're using R, they can import it from SVSS, SAV, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's their problem, not your problem. They published the standard of how Who's this they? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure, but uh, I, I need to look. Okay. Uh, I have a Figshare account because the University of Auckland pays for it. And I have uploaded my data sets there. That's yeah. where you got them from. I didn't, no one told me how to do it. I just went, okay, anonymous. ID number, here's the scores, up it goes. I chose what to put up, mm -hmm. but it went up in SBSS and it has a data dictionary. And I explained it. There's no one said, oh, but you forgot the comma on the apostrophe or whatever. You know, like, no. You just, if it's a readable data set, it's a readable data set. I don't, don't, don't overthink this, folks. And the beauty, of course, maybe in your country is different from mine. In my country, the responsibility of what you put on your data repository is your responsibility. And no one's going to check. And if someone says, but actually variable number three, there's something on. Oh, okay, I can go and fix it. No, it's my responsibility. So far, no one has told me, you mustn't do this because now I know that what bit score Billy got. No one knows who gave these scores. I don't even know because they were anonymous surveys. They were teacher number 133. I don't know who teacher number 133 is. But teacher 133 told me they were a man or a woman and what year they had and what degree they had. And, you know, they, they told me things about them, but I don't know who they are. Maxine? Yeah, because I wonder if you publish uh, your instrument, so you do not only publish your data, you publish your Sure. The, the, the study on the instrument is published and then I make the data available for others to
But yeah. you publish uh, the keys for your instrument too, otherwise. Yes. Yeah. But uh, in this case, your instrument started to be in web because no. everybody have access to your instrument. No. I would. Oh, but it's not a. But it's not. A, my instruments are not designed to be high qual, high consequence tests. So it's also no, no knowledge. Uh, so yeah, they're not tests. And if I wanted to publish test information, you could publish the key and the data for a test that you're not planning to use again. Yeah. If it's an operational test, that's a different problem. My colleagues at the Swedish SAT in Umeå do not, are required by law to publish the items after each administration. If they publish the items, they may as well publish the data. So you can do analyses. And so they have a shop of people creating new items all year round because they give this test twice a year. So they have to keep... And now there'll be some items that are secure, so they wouldn't publish them. But the law in Sweden says, this was a publicly funded test, you must disclose the test after it's administered. Because if it's, we have this principle of freedom of information. And if the information is paid by the taxpayer, the taxpayer is entitled to have it. Because it actually belongs to the taxpayer, not to the government. That may not be the same in every other country. <laughs> This is, this is the world Europe and the English-speaking world is moving towards. We're moving to a world of open, transparent government where freedom of information is required by law. The Americans might be a little bit struggling with it at times, but they're generally on, on board with this. Okay, so... Here's our example data set. We've got 10 minutes just to quickly flick through this, and then this afternoon you can play with it, okay? There's a data set with the student conceptions of assessment, Brazil and New Zealand. Remember, there was one item that wasn't administered in Brazil. So here's my eight-factor model again. We've seen this before. And here's the configural in invariance test. It says the items are ordered, and then it says the mean structure is true, the standardized levels are true, group equals country. So without the group information, it's going to go, well, what am I invariant, what am I comparing? And so I called it configural fit because I'm just seeing does the model work both ways and if it's under 0.08. Now here's the weak or metric invariance commands. What have I added here? Data, WLMS, blah, blah, blah. mean structure equals true, standard level equals true, group equals country, group equal equals C the loadings, remember, because that's the thing that it told you in the output table that that was called. The loadings are the metric. And if we wanted to see if it was the same for loadings and intercepts, we put a comma after loadings, comma, and we would add intercepts. And if we wanted to do strict, we would do loadings, intercepts, resid variances. So we would add them sequentially. Eve has written a nice little analysis of variance to see if this model is different by more than chance. So he's written this, and so you put metric fit, which is this model, the second model goes first, comma, the comparison model was the config fit model. And so it's always a two-group comparison, 
and we're comparing the fit with the fit. And this is, if it's not statistically significant, go to the next comparison and you write the code for that, which is, you would obviously want to change the name so that you have it as scalar fit. And then you would want to put loadings and intercepts in here. All right? So once you write the boring part, the change in command is actually really simple. And this is what the first comparison gives me. It's using a diagonal weighted least squares. And 288, 872, 8 goes into 30, some, what, 8 3s are 24, 8 4s are 32, so it's somewhere between 3 and 4. Closer to 4 than 3, it might be okay. The shift parameter, here's the chi-square for each group. Notice the chi-square is smaller for group 1 than group 2, which means it's closer in group 1 than group 2. And group 1 was New Zealand, group 2 was Brazil. All right, so there's more noise in the Brazil group than in the... And here's the fit statistics. And compared to the baseline, the CFIs are fine. And the TLIs are fine, but again, CFI, TLI. RMSDA, 0.06A, 0.069, okay, 6.572, yeah, okay. So, you know, it's looking you know, acceptable-ish. SRMR, okay, so it's looking kind of okay. And so we come to this. So you can see what he's doing is the degrees of freedom change. Degrees of freedom, 872, 896 for the metric fit and config fit. Config fit has smaller because I haven't specified as many parameters. The metric fit has more degrees of freedom. So there's a difference of 24 because that was 24, is that right? 2 from 6 is 4, 7 from 9 is 2. 24 degrees of freedom change. Chi-square difference. Degrees of free difference in degrees of freedom, 24. Difference in degrees of chi-square, 304. What's the probability of that? Really significant. So, do they differ by too much, or are they okay? What is? How do you interpret that result? It's a chi-square test. So, would you say, is the difference beyond chance or not? That's the difference we're looking at in the two models. This would say, eh. Chung and Renswold, Vandenberg and Lance would say, well, wait a minute, go look at the CFI values and see how much they changed. Okay? So one test is, this is the chi-square difference test. Remember what I said earlier at the beginning, the chi-square difference test is really super sensitive. Depends on the sample size. And the complexity of the model, and how many parameters you changed, and set. So a change of 24 and a change of 300, that's more than 10 for one degree of freedom. Of course it's statistically significant. Right, so that test says, no, they're not the same. What would a difference in CFI say? Do I have, have I done that? Does it also show this difference? I mean, the problem doesn't show this difference. Does it calculate uh, the change in CFI? No, but when you, when you tell this model to produce the summary, you'll see the CFI. And then you can tell this model, model to see the summary, and you'll see the CFI. So the summary command is where you're going to see the CFI. And then you just subtract? Yeah. And if the difference is more than 0.01, eh. Okay? So, this, sorry, this code, this code does not automate compare CFI. This code automates compare chi-square difference. Right? And I already told you, 
and you probably don't want to trust that one because it's too sensitive and gives red flags falsely. What you want to do is look at the CFI, look at the CFI, work out the difference. It's only a three-digit number, so it shouldn't be hard to do for somebody with a master's in measurement and psychometrics, you know, like just 0.9 something compared to 0.9 something. Because this was the configurable results. And where the CFI is not here, you have to generate the you have to ch generate the fit measures true to see the CFI for statistics. Or you might have to use the fit measures all command to get, where's my CFI value? All right? So at this stage, that test says they're not the same. Damn, I wanted them to at least be metric equivalent. And if you wanted to start diagnosing, a partially equivalent problem. So here's the output for BAP. And you're looking at 99994. 740, 740. 442, 442. 510, 510. 135, so if you want to see the freely estimated, you have to go back to the output from before you did the metric equivalence, before you did group equal. Okay. If this group equal says no, they're not equal, then you have to go back and look at this version where there's no equality to see how are they different. Right? So don't get trapped into, it says it's not metric equivalent, but why are the numbers the same? And now, when you go back to the metric loadings unconstrained in the configurable model, you can see <coughs> the numbers are not identical. But some of them might not be a big difference. You know, 70, 60, you know, 50, 33, 62, 38, 67, what? Negative 19. Bang. <laughs> you know, like, holy smoke. Clearly, this item really behaves differently. I really want to create an equivalent model, so maybe you should delete BD5. All right? So that so you would save your data set without BD5, create your model without your BD5. You don't have to save the data set. You just tell the model not to include BD5 anymore, run it again, and see if that makes a difference. But this is just BD and CE. What about the other scales? 65, 69, 59. You know, you mu you'd have to have some sort of tolerance. Bigger than how much means, wow, there's a real problem. Uh, 79, 81, no one cares, right? 76, 84, no, I don't care. 84, 70, well that's 14 points. Do I care? So you might say, if it's bigger than point 20, I should really consider removing that item to create an equivalent, have a greater chance of finding an equivalent. So clearly, those two are so different. So yes, my But can you compare the text size of this case and decide well, this is just the standardized value, so they're on the same scale, so I can legitimately compare them. I'm not doing anything but eyeball at this stage. I mean, you know, you could go seven, there's your standard errors, and there's your standard errors, and you could plot that and see they're not overlapping, and, you know, so you could do a simple subtraction. You could say, well, uh, 85 is bigger than 82, but 82 plus 2 of this is 90. 80, that's greater than 85, so clearly they overlap. You could do a simple add and subtract two standard errors and see if the numbers overlap, if you really wanted to know if the tolerance was there. Or you could just eyeball it and go, holy smoke, that one's different. Let's 
I wonder what would happen if we tried it without that, right? And then you'd have to think about what does that, how does that change the meaning if I suddenly go DD5 is out. Fortunately, there's five of them, so I'll still get a factor with four. If you don't trust, you could go online to Vassar. Vassar is a very famous university in the